Today's video is brought to you by Policy Genius. If you have family members who depend on your income, you need life insurance. And that's where Policy Genius comes in. More about them in a bit. On April the 7th, 2011, a BM-21 Grad rocket was launched from Gaza towards Israel, the latest in a steady stream that had begun to do exactly what they were designed to do, to create widespread psychological trauma within the Israeli population. But this day was different. This day marked the first time Israel's Iron Dome successfully downed an incoming missile. The mobile all-weather air defense system that had been developed by Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aerospace Industries has since gone on to intercept roughly 90% of rockets fired towards Israel that would have landed in populated areas. This is by far the most comprehensive missile defense system of its type that the world has ever seen, and numerous other countries are already lining up to purchase this Israeli technology. But the effect that this has had on the seemingly never-ending Israel-Palestine conflict is very much up for debate. And with violence flaring once again in 2021, the Iron Dome may have brought extra security, but it certainly hasn't brought peace. So where do we even begin with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? A conflict that now goes back over 70 years and has included numerous neighboring countries. In total, Israel has fought eight recognized wars since its formation in 1948, including two Palestinian intifadas, or uprisings. We don't have nearly enough time to go into it all, but for the sake of the background to Israel's Iron Dome, it is important to set the scene at least. When Israel was officially formed on the 14th of May 1948, a new country emerged in the Middle East. The only problem was it lay precisely in the land that was known as Palestine, which for the last 30 years or so had been under British rule. Now, we're not going to dive into the quagmire of right and wrong and who was their first debate, but what came out has been deeply unpleasant to say the least. Over the first few decades, neighboring Arab countries fought a series of wars against Israel with little success. If anything, the state of Israel grew during this time. The six-day war between Israel and a coalition of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria was a disaster for the Arab nations and the Palestinian people. It left Israel in control of Gaza and the West Bank, and those living there effectively under occupation. Hatred and resentment have been bubbling away in Palestine for some time, and you can understand why. A border wall had been created between Israel and two Palestinian zones, while Israeli settlements continued to expand into areas that had previously been set aside for Palestinians. As the occupying power, Israel is technically responsible for healthcare and other services within Palestine, but it remains horribly underfunded and heavily reliant on aid. In short, life for many Palestinians remains in painful limbo, and you don't need to be a genius to see how resentment can quickly turn to violence. The first intifada began in December 1987 in the Jabalia refugee camp after an Israeli army truck collided with a civilian car, killing the four Palestinians inside. The Palestinians claimed the collision had been on purpose in response to the murder of a Jew in Gaza a few days earlier, an accusation that Israel firmly denied. Violence broke out within Gaza and the West Bank while an economic boycott targeting Israeli-made goods along with a call for Palestinians working in Israel to strike quickly developed. The conflict dragged on for nearly six years and claimed 1,962 Palestinian lives, with between 300 and 800 of those killed by intra-Palestinian violence, with some seeking out those who had collaborated with the Israelis. 277 Israelis also died in the first intifada, 175 civilians, and 102 security personnel. The second intifada exploded in 2000 as a result of both the breakdown in peace talks at Camp David in the US and Israeli opposition leader Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount, which is widely considered the third holiest site in Islam. This time, the violence escalated with suicide bombings, rock throwing, gunfire, and rocket attacks that were met with vicious retaliation from the Israelis. 3,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis, as well as 64 foreigners, died in the Second Intifada, which ended in February 2005. <laughs> It's thought that the first rocket fired by Palestinian militants came in October 2001, which hit an Israeli settlement in the Gaza Strip. 
The first rocket to enter Israel itself came the following year, on the 10th of February 2002, landing in Kibbutz Saad. On the 5th of March 2002, the city of Sterot became the first major population center to be hit. These early projectiles were the Qassam rocket, which has a range of about 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles, but over time, more advanced rockets have been used with greater range. It's not always exactly clear who has launched the rockets, though some groups do occasionally claim responsibility. According to the Israeli Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center, the majority come from two groups, either the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Al-Quds, or Hamas, a Palestinian resistance movement and political organization that currently holds power. Depending on who you ask, Hamas is either a terrorist organization or freedom fighters who have successfully gained control through honest electoral means, or they could also be both. During the 2006 Second Lebanon War, approximately 4,000 Hezbollah-fired rockets landed in northern Israel, including in Haifa, the country's third largest city. The attacks killed 44 Israeli citizens, while another 250,000 were evacuated from the region. 4,000 rockets and 4,000 mortars were fired into Israel between 2000 and 2008, mainly from the Gaza Strip. The psychological effect this had on the Israeli population was dramatic, and a decision was taken to implement a new form of defense. Now, speaking of new layers of protection, what's the situation? situation with your life insurance, because I know you probably don't like to think about it, but the reality is that it's an important layer of protection for many families, especially for single-income households. Fortunately, there's today's video sponsor, Policy Genius, and their award-winning policy options ranked number one by Forbes. Whether you've been putting off your purchase or you just never really thought about it, Policy Genius is the team that you want to check in with. This is a third-party marketplace that works for you, not for the insurance companies, so you can trust that their licensed experts are going to give you solid and unbiased advice. Life insurance premiums might seem like a financial drain, but you could save $1,300 or more per year using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. If you're interested, please do head to policygenius.com to get started. In just a few minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. And when you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and the scheduling all for free. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius and getting covered now locks in your rate. Over the course of a 10 or 20 year policy, those savings really do add up. And best of all, eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week. So head to policygenius.com to get started and you'll be glad you did because when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And now, back to today's video. The Iron Dome was one of several options available to the Israeli authorities, but in February 2007 it was selected by Defense Minister Amir Peretz in the hope that it could be Israel's savior. The technology was developed by Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aerospace Industries, and it's thought to have initially cost in the region of $210 million, which is fairly sizable, but considering that the new U.S. aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald R. Ford, cost roughly $13.3 billion, it doesn't actually seem like that much money. $200 million bargain. <laughs> The current system is not a single entity, but rather 10 separate iron domes that effectively overlap to provide complete coverage. Funding for the first two iron dome systems came from Israel, while the next eight, along with a steady supply of missiles, came from the United States. After President Obama formally requested $205 million from Congress in his 2011 budget. And that was just for 2011. Since then, it's thought that the total U.S. expenditure for the iron dome has crept past a billion dollars. But from the sounds of things, that is just the start. After its introduction in 2011, Defense Minister Director General Major General Udi Shani said that Israel plans to invest nearly a billion dollars in the coming years to expand the Iron Dome even further in anticipation of reduced U.S. funding. Much of the development and testing process was highly secretive, but it's thought that the Iron Dome went from the drawing board to the battlefield in just four years, which is a remarkable achievement in itself. The first interceptor missiles were tested in July 2008, and in March 2009, the system underwent a full test without actually intercepting a rocket, that is. But just a few months later, in July 2009, a successful defense ministry test was carried out in which projectiles mimicking the Qassam rockets were intercepted. In January 2010, the Iron Dome again successfully 
successfully intercepted a barrage designed to mimic an attack on a populated area, and in July 2010, the final major test saw the Iron Dome distinguish between rockets that would land in urban areas and those that wouldn't. It proved to be the seal of approval needed, and the first two Iron Domes were officially operational in March 2011, with the newly created battalion of the Israeli Air Force's Air Defense Division placed in charge. The first sites chosen for the interceptor missiles were near Beersheba in southern Israel, close to the border with Gaza, which had seen rockets land close by before the Iron Dome's development. The Iron Dome is an all-weather defense system that protects urban populations or designated assets and is generally considered the most sophisticated system of its type anywhere in the world. It's designed to guard against short-range rockets and 155mm 6.1-inch artillery shells with a range of up to 70 kilometers or 43 miles, though it's believed that Israel plans to increase this to 250 kilometers or 155 miles in the future. The Iron Dome is really three separate components that work together at breathtaking speed while a rocket is inbound. When an enemy rocket is fired, the detection and tracking radar built by Alta, an Israeli defense company, locates the device and tracks its progress. At the same time, information is passed to the battle management and weapon control built by Empress Systems, which calculates the impact point. If that impact point is deemed a danger, the control system alerts the designated mobile missile firing unit in the area to launch one of its Tamir interceptor missiles to blow up the incoming rocket. It may sound absurdly simple, but Israel claims that it works 90% of the time. As I mentioned, the Iron Dome only fires its interceptor missiles if it deems the inbound rocket to be a threat to a populated area or another specially designated area, or which could be a military installation or just oil refineries. This is primarily down to cost, with each interception thought to cost between $100,000 and $150,000, compared to just $800 that a crudely made rocket can be constructed for. The Tamir missiles are 3 meters, 9.8 feet in length, and have a diameter of 160 millimeters or 6.3 inches. They come with steering fins for high maneuverability and are equipped with electro-optic sensors. They travel at a maximum speed of Mach 2.2 and have a proximity fuse that allows them to detonate close to the rocket being targeted. On April the 7th, 2011, the Iron Dome intercepted its first live rocket, which had been fired from Gaza. Despite the Israeli government claiming that the system was still in an evaluation phase, it successfully intercepted four more rockets the following day. The Iron Dome had made a strong start. But it didn't take long for its perfect score to come to an end. On the 20th of August 2011, a barrage of seven rockets came hurtling into Israel from Gaza. The Iron Dome reacted and intercepted all of the perceived threats, bar one, which crashed into a residential area in Beersheba, killing one person. It was around this time that militants began to switch tactics by launching a barrage of multiple rockets in the hope that at least one would make it through the Israeli shield. Despite the missed rockets, the Iron Dome was already proving a huge success, and it seemed the only consideration was where to put the two operating systems as mayors from around Israel tried to pressure the government to deploy the Iron Dome in their regions. With this in mind, the government announced that one additional Iron Dome would be in operation in a matter of weeks, while additional systems would appear in six months, rather than the initially stated 18 months. In August 2011, the third system became operational near Ashdod, and by the end of the year, the three systems were recording a 75% success rate. Over the next few years, more Iron Domes were installed throughout Israel, bringing the current number up to 10, though according to experts, that number may need to be doubled to provide the comprehensive protection that the Israeli population have come to expect. There have been a few periods of intense activity for the Iron Domes, usually coinciding with military operations on the ground. On the 14th of November 2012, Ahmed Jabari, chief of the Gaza military wing of Hamas, was killed by an Israeli airstrike, resulting in over 100 rockets being launched at Israel over 20 Four hours. The Iron Dome stood firm, though four Israeli civilians and two soldiers were killed. In response, the Israeli army launched Operation Pillar of Defense, in which they struck more than 1,500 sites in Gaza. From the Palestinian side, 1,456 rockets were fired towards Israel in the biggest test of the Iron Dome so far. About 421 rockets were intercepted, another 142 fell on Gaza itself, 875 fell in open areas, and 58 hit urban areas in Israel. The 2014 Gaza War was another key 
key moment for domes. After the kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers, the Israeli Defense Force launched Operation Brothers Keeper to arrest militant leaders, which was eventually followed by Operation Protective Edge as both sides traded blows. The conflict was short but intense, lasting 50 days, in which 4,594 rockets and mortars were fired at Israeli targets. Of those, roughly 25% were deemed threatening, mainly down to the poor quality of the rockets and low accuracy. The Iron Domes intercepted 735 projectiles, with 70 making it through. Overall, the system achieved a 90% success rate during the conflict. Now, we do have to point out here that while the Iron Dome was incredibly successful at defending the Israelis, the cost of the Palestinians over the 50 days was horrific, with close to 2,500 people dying. And sadly, this has become the standard narrative. When fighting breaks out, one side has the most sophisticated missile defense system the world has ever seen, while on the other, it's not uncommon to be without running water and electricity. This isn't a fair fight, but then again, it never has been. One criticism often leveled at the Iron Dome is not about its operational ability, which seems to speak for itself, but whether the Dome has created a sense of security in Israel that distracts from actually forging a lasting peace. The shield has almost provided a sense of invulnerability, which no doubt does little to persuade people that it's in their best interests to force their government to the negotiating table. And this doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon, with two additional stages of the defense system, David Sling and Arrow, also in operation. David David's sling is similar to the Iron Dome, but considerably more expensive and can intercept enemy planes, drones, tactical ballistic missiles, medium to long range rockets, and cruise missiles fired at ranges from 40 kilometers to 300 kilometers away. Arrow, on the other hand, is an anti ballistic missile system that has been in use for just over two decades with a wary eye further abroad, particularly on the Islamic Republic of Iran. Israel now has probably the most comprehensive defense system in the world, and nations such as the United States, India, Azerbaijan, South Korea, and Romania are queuing up to purchase the Iron Dome system. But despite all this coverage, the situation between Israel and Palestine remains dreadful. The recent conflict between the two in May 2021, in which 13 Israelis and 256 Palestinians died, reminded everybody that the end still feels nowhere in sight. In terms of missile defense systems, the Iron Dome is unparalleled, and the number of Israeli casualties has fallen dramatically since it was rolled out. In that sense, it's a huge success, but unfortunately in this particular conflict, a huge success for one side usually means pain and suffering on the other. The Iron Dome may be military technology at its most cutting edge, but it is neither perfect, nor is it the long-term answer. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.